May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our text for this morning comes from the epistle reading, which includes these words from Paul. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. This is our text. You may be seated. Dear Saints, Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. And Paul writes in our epistle reading this morning, For the creation waits with eager longing. The creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. And the creation is in bondage to decay. And we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Or to paraphrase Solomon and Paul, the world is an utter mess. The creation first groaned when Adam and Eve fell into sin. When God found out Satan was cursed, Eve was cursed, Adam was cursed, and the ground was cursed. Adam and Eve subjected the world to futility. The sun and the moon and the stars, the creeping things that creep along the earth, the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the beasts of the field, these did not sin against God. These did not disobey the will of God, yet, as gifts to mankind, they share in the curse of mankind's sin. The creation groans with tornado and hurricane, flood and drought, with earthquake and volcano. The creation groans with the dead deer on the side of the road, with the beached whale that isn't in the right place, with the feral dogs running loose on the streets, creation groans as nation wages war against nation, as man commits violence against his fellow man. Creation groans as some have too much and others not enough. And as it groans, it waits. It waits to be freed from this futility, from this constant and ever-increasing decay. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. We too groan. We groan when we're told we need the surgeon's knife we groan when a loved one gets sick or dies. We groan under the guilt of our own sin and the shame of the sin committed against us. We groan when we don't do the good we want to do and the evil we do not want to do, this we keep on doing. As we who have the Holy Spirit, as those whose souls have been saved from eternal death through our baptism, through faith, we wait. We wait for the redemption of our body, Paul said. We long for that day when there is no sin or sickness or death in these decaying bodies, and what is now mortal will be made immortal. Now the non-Christian also observes the world groaning. Christians and non-Christians alike see the devastation brought about by natural disasters. They see the wars. They see the violence. Everyone knows things are out of whack. But the non-Christian has many answers as to the why. Oh, it's the fault of some pagan god. It's the fault of fate or of randomness. It's the fault of evolution not being quite done yet, or it's the fault of a particular neglect on mankind's part. But the Christian knows better. We know only one cause of all of this, 
It is sin. It is original sin. It is the actual sins committed by people, including you and me. Sin is the problem, and there is no human solution, no human remedy for human sin. And so we groan over it. So what do we do? Paul says that along with the creation, we wait. We wait with patience. For we are given a hope that the world does not have. This hope produces a certain calmness, a certain peace while we wait. It is not wishful thinking. It is not fairy tale or fantasy. But it is hope because, Paul says, we do not yet see it. We don't have hope that Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead. We have faith in that. We have faith that in our baptism our sins are forgiven. We have faith that when the pastor tells us your sins are forgiven, that it is true. We have faith that from the altar we receive the body and the blood of Jesus. We have hope in the promises of God that have not yet been fulfilled. Jesus, the crucified and risen one, will return again in glory to judge the nations in equity, to judge you and me, and he will judge you and me not on the basis of the sins over which we're groaning, but on the basis of his own righteousness, which he has given you, the righteousness that comes solely through faith in him. This is our hope. Hope is certainty of faith in the things that God has promised that we have not yet seen. He has promised that he will raise us from the dead, the redemption of our bodies to live with him in eternity, in the new heavens and in the new earth, and we know that this will come to pass. Though we don't know when, we know with certainty that it is true. Since we have hope for these things, we wait for them with patience. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we have hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. There is a saying you may have heard. It's uh, attributed to Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. I've heard it several times, even from Christians. This is the saying, some people are so heavenly minded that they are no earthly good. Some people are so heavenly minded that they are no earthly good. It implies that a Christian whose mind and heart are set on the things for which we are hoping, the things that we are waiting for, that such people are of little or no use in this earthly life. This is utter nonsense. For we know the hope that we have in the things that are to come, this hope changes our lives now. We know that upon our own deaths, we will be in heaven. We know that Christ will return in glory to remake the heavens and the earth. And this hope shapes and changes how we live day to day, even now. Paul says in verse 18 of our text, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. This hope in what's coming puts the sufferings we experience now into their proper place and their proper context. They are temporary. Our groaning will end. This, the time-bound tribulations of this world in comparison to the eternal glory that is ours not even worth comparing, Paul said. All throughout Scripture, we are enjoined to focus on this hope. The hope of the things to come. 2 Corinthians 4. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, 
the things that are unseen are eternal. Colossians 3, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Or Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. This eternal hope brings peace and comfort and joy in the midst of the groanings of this life. It is with this joy of eternity that we can endure suffering, persecution, it is with this joy of eternity that we can serve one another in sacrificial love, even our unbelieving neighbors, because we know that the Lord supplies all that we need for this life and for the life to come. And the things that we might cling to in this life, they're passing away. It is with this joy of eternity that we teach our children and grandchildren the things that our Lord would have them know. It is with this joy of eternity that we can share the gospel, tell of God's miraculous and wonderful salvation to one another, because any discomfort or persecution we might face on account of it, it's temporary. It is with this joy of eternity that we can live bold lives dedicated to Jesus as we live out our vocation, living as his people in a world that is opposed to him, living as wheat in the midst of the weeds. We leave all things to Jesus in his time and his judgment. This hope of the eternal life gives us a completely different perspective on the here and now. In fact, it is with this hope that we are able to pray. And what of prayer? Paul writes, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We are weak, Paul says. Even our prayers are weak. So weak are we, we don't know how to pray or what to pray for. But the Holy Spirit knows, and he lives within you. The Spirit takes our feeble and weak and incomplete prayers up to God on our behalf, wrapping them with his own perfect words, and sets them before the Father, petitioning him for the things that we need even before we know that we need them. The prayers of the saints are made perfect by the Spirit. As we pray the words, forgive us our trespasses, the Spirit knows what those trespasses are, even the ones that we've forgotten, and he brings them up to the Father, and he looks at the Son sitting at the right hand of the Father, and he says, these two are forgiven. As we pray, lead us not into temptation. The Spirit knows the temptations we face now and the ones that we will face in the future, and he pleads to the Father that we be delivered from them. As we pray, thy kingdom come, the Spirit asks the Father to give us patience, and fortitude, and courage, and joy, and hope in the midst of a world full of weeds. He bids us patience as we wait. We groan, and the Holy Spirit groans with us in perfect groans. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the world is broken, and we are broken, and it is all on account of sin. We groan together as we wait at the redemption of this world, and the redemption of our bodies is coming. In Christ's resurrection, we have a beautiful picture of our own future. We who have faith and hope, the first fruits of the Spirit, though we groan now in our mortal lives, we know that our own resurrection awaits. And we have the certainty that God has promised it, and it must come to pass. Thanks be to God. In the name of Jesus. Amen.